if you're a beginner programmer and you're just starting to dive into like using Express or Node.js to write out web APIs, this video should help you understand how to reduce the coupling in your modules and hopefully write a little bit of better, cleaner code. So as you're watching through these examples that I'm going to give you, just keep in mind that these are just really small examples, but if you kind of analyze your own code and think about these before you start writing new lines of code, I think it can help you write better code that's cleaner and less coupled. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, I have a node application that's using Express. So if I look at the index.js over here, you can see it's a really simple Express application with one endpoint. So if you're not familiar with Express, it's basically a web API for node. You install the Express module, and then you can start setting up endpoints to allow browsers to connect to. So what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at one controller in this little code example I'm giving and just show you how the code works and maybe talk about ways that we can make it a little bit cleaner and less coupled. So off the bat, we have a controller function, right? This is typically how you write your little express functions. If you're a beginner, you know, you have a function that takes in a request object and a response object. And then throughout your code, you're grabbing stuff from the request and you're sending stuff back at the bottom from a response. Now, if you know anything about the clean architecture approach to writing code, you'll know that the first thing is that you've increased the coupling between your express module that you're using and your business logic. Okay, this is what we call business logic. This is like the business rules of someone would define to you and you need to implement that in your business logic layer. So the reason that passing the request object into your business logic is an issue is because in the future, if you decide that you don't want to use Express.js and you want to use Nest.js or Happy.js, well, now you have all of these little objects sprinkled all throughout your code base. And if you're not careful, you could pass this request object even further into more functions. So this makes it really hard or almost impossible to transition to a new web API framework if you have this Express request passed all throughout your code base. So I left a comment here and I said bad. This is coupled with Express, Rec, and Res. So what I would do or what I would recommend to not be so coupled to Express inside your business logic is basically convert this function to just take in what it needs from the request. So in this case, this function really just needs two things. It needs a student ID and it needs a class ID. All right, so that would basically remove the need to having all this. And down here, we are, we're going to fix this in a second. Actually, let's just return classroom as well. So now we don't have the need for the request object to get the student ID or the class ID. Instead, it's passed in. And then also, we don't need to do a res.send because then we're coupling our business logic to the Express library itself. So that alone is a huge win. And now, obviously, we have to go back to where we're calling this and we have to basically do a very similar approach. Um, let me just go ahead and refactor this a little bit just to show you what I'm talking about. So now what we just basically need to do is just pass in student ID, uh, if I could type that in correctly, pass in class ID and just do a res.send on whatever is returned from that method. Additionally, this is probably an asynchronous method, so we need to do this. And you might say, well, this is a lot of extra overhead just to write a simple function. And you can write like your own wrapper function that takes in a callback and then grabs the stuff that it needs. But I think overall, this has been more beneficial because now you don't need to actually verify that you're grabbing the student ID or class ID from the request object. So this is a better approach because now we can just verify this with a simple unit test and just pass in student ID and class ID. And we don't have to worry about passing in a request object and mocking it out and making sure we set the right headers and making sure we set the right body and payload and params. It's just a function, takes in some things, returns some things. All right, I'm going to move on and skip this one because this one's a little bit more advanced. But let's look at another one. So reading through this function, what happens is when you call this controller function, we fetch the student data from whatever function this is. So this is abstracted away from you, but this is probably reading from a database and that's going to return you some student data. Additionally, we have a get classroom, pass it a classroom ID, and this is probably going to hit a database like MongoDB or SQL and return you that classroom data. Once you have that data, I'm passing it into something that I like to call entities. Um, you can call these models. It doesn't really matter, but basically this is a class that encapsulates what your student data should look like. And then you'd probably want to have a bunch of validation on side of this or inside of this entity slash model to verify certain things like email and password. I didn't actually add any validation code, 
you probably want some validation in this function. So hopefully you understand how that kind of works. You, like you make a new student object, this should throw an exception if bad student data was passed in or returned from the database. So if we look at the purpose of this function, this is supposed to take a student and add them to the class entity, okay? So if you look down here, I have this label as bad because we are accessing some private methods on the student model and the classroom model or entity. I'm probably gonna um, flip back and forth between model and entity, but they're the same thing in my opinion. So the reason this is bad is because you've increased the coupling between all of this business logic and how the underlying entity kind of stores its representation of if a student is enrolled or not. So the issue is, let's say in the future, you decide that you don't want to store this as is enrolled, you wanna store this like um, is part of a class. All right, so you might make that little refactoring and now you've pretty much broken your application because this is kind of dependent on the internal implementation of this student entity. So I'd recommend instead of accessing this is enrolled private method or private um, property on the student, I would instead add a function or a method to the student entity called like, I don't know, set is enrolled. And this could basically set that underlying um, ish, the underlying Boolean to whatever you want it to, okay? So this is a little bit of a better approach because now your controller doesn't really have to know about the internal details of whatever. It could just simply call a function and then later on down the road, if you need to change the internals of this, you can do so without having other things break. So that is kind of like one of the key things they teach in like Java and object-oriented programming. Um, it's all about encapsulation. Um, but let's just try to do the same thing for this classroom object, right? So in the classroom object, underneath that classroom class, it has an array of students, right? So if you add a student to a classroom, you need to pretty much push that student onto the student's array. So inside the controller, it doesn't really make sense to have this controller know about that students array. So instead of doing students.push here, you should probably call some type of method that is on the classroom class and say like, I don't know, add student, okay? So I would instead do something like this and then inside of that classroom, you could say add student. I could take in a student argument and I'm gonna say this.students.push of student. Now what you could also do if you wanna take this a step further, is instead of calling set is enrolled here, you could technically set that inside of your classroom add student if you wanted to, because um, it, it really depends on your business logic. You could do this, uh, it just really depends. Um, so you could just go ahead and say set is enrolled on, on this method itself, because whenever a student is added to a class, you wanna make sure that they are set to true. They are enrolled in something. Um, but you could run into issues down the road with like side effects, so I'm actually gonna just go ahead and keep that here, but just keep that in mind, like you don't have to do all this entity stuff separately. You can combine your entity logics together, I believe. So I think that's a little bit better than what it was. Hopefully you understand why that's better. Again, you don't want other classes knowing the internal operations or internal implementation details of different um, modules. All right, so let's talk about what happens next. So basically we, we take the student and we save it. And then we also save the classroom to the database. So these are both saving to the database so that when someone loads the classroom in the UI or someone loads a student, they can see that they're enrolled or that they have that student in that class. And then finally, we try to send out a welcome email to the student who we just added to the class. So let's skip this little comment and we're gonna move on to this one first because I think this was a little bit easier. So I put this as bad because we have a method that we're sending the full student object, but technically, Send welcome email doesn't really need to know about the full student object. It really just needs to know about like the email and the name. So if you were to go to that method, let me just show you this. This is using node mailer to basically take the student and it's creating a welcome message using the student's name. Again, this is like bad practice because now we're grabbing a private member of the student. Instead, this should probably be a method. But we are taking the name of the student, making a message, and then we basically send that email to the student's email address, right? So this could be arguable. Maybe it's cool to push the student into this method because in the future, you may need more things off of the student. But honestly, if you only need name and email, I would basically just pass those into the function and that's going to reduce the coupling that this function has to your student object.
All right, so instead of passing student here, we're going to pass name and email. So I'll say name is student.name, email is student.email. And again, we could probably refactor student a little bit more to make these getters. So I'll say get name, and then I'll say get email. All right, and just make sure you go into that student object and you add those. So get, get name. I think there's a different way you can do ES6 getters. I think you put like a get keyword. I haven't really used it that much, but um, just keep that in mind. You can do that if you need that. So I'm just going to say return this.name, and then I'm going to say get email is return this.email. Okay, so now what we've done is basically put a buffer between this module and the student object itself so that this, this class doesn't need to know about where the name is stored or where the email is stored. It just needs to know how to get a name. And what this allows us to do is later on, let's say that instead of returning this.name, you actually have first name and you also say like um, a last name, right? So what if behind the scenes you no longer have name? Well, you would have broken that controller where you were accessing name before. And now you need to make sure that return first name and last name concatenated. So instead, you could just go to get name here and say, well, it's just the first name plus a space plus, you know, the last name or something. So again, this is why encapsulation is good. It helps create a buffer. It reduces the coupling between your um, components. So let's kind of go back. I hope this whole method makes sense now, but let's go back to these two comments. These are a little bit more advanced. And again, they kind of dive into the whole concept of clean architecture. So imagine this scenario. Let's say that you're storing all your student data inside of MongoDB. And for some reason, you decide that MongoDB is not a good solution. Instead, you want to store it inside of SQL. Okay, so right now you have a kind of coupled this component. Whenever you have a require statement, you're actually coupling this piece of code to this other piece of code, right? This code is requiring this code. So it's kind of coupled together. To kind of reduce that coupling, what you can do is instead have the dependencies kind of passed in. So there's a concept called dependency inversion, where instead of having this child component require its dependencies, you have the parent component, which would be this, kind of pass in the dependencies that this controller would need. So let's just go ahead and try to do that. Again, this people could argue that this is over-engineering and it makes your code harder to understand. And in a sense, it does make it harder to follow and understand, but it adds the benefit of it's very easy to switch out implementation on the fly if you decide that you don't want to store something in Mongo and you have a different implementation. So what you can do instead of requiring these two things, so get student and get classroom, which I guess I didn't even load in. Let's just pretend I did. Instead of requiring those here, you can have those passed in as some type of dependency object, right? So I can say get student is something passed in and get classroom is also something passed in. And then instead, what we could do is require those two functions inside of the parent component. So get student and get classroom. So that is an object. Um, just keep in mind that you can do this however, whatever way you want. There's different ways that you can do dependency inversion. You could do like a dependency injection framework. You could do some type of like um, service listener. I think it's called like service registration or something. But basically now this parent class, you could require those get student methods. So I could say like require uh, where were those stored? Persistence, get student. There's also get classroom. So now what we could do is require them and the parent component and pass them in. And then you can use them inside of your controller. And now your controller doesn't depend on requiring those. So again, what this allows you to do is you can easily switch out what this is. So if I had a different like get classroom v2 file or something, let me just pretend I have a file called get classroom v2. What I can easily do is just like this, change it, and now my implementation is going to run some different type of code. Notice I can run completely different logic and have it fed from MySQL here. Um, you know, instead of instead of v2, I'm going to say like SQL. I could have this fetch from SQL instead, but now I didn't have to touch this class at all. So it really helps you decouple your components and allow for a more cleaner architecture with the trade-off of the code can be a little bit more confusing to understand, I guess. And then the same thing goes down here. Like these are persistence methods for saving the student and saving the classroom. Again, these 
could potentially be passed in using dependency inversion, and we could just not require them anymore. Same with this method as well. Um, we could pass them all in. This might be a little crazy if you're kind of new to this uh, paradigm. Save student and save classroom. But let's just pretend that we have all these imported. Again, this is just an example. This code's not going to be actually like functional. But now all of these could potentially be passed in. And what this allows you to do, another big benefit, is testing this with a unit tester like Jest is really easy because now you don't need to do Jest.mock or Jest.spy um, on any of these things. Like typically in Jest, it's kind of difficult to mock out these require statements. Instead, what you can do is you can just call this function and pass it different stubs or different mocks or spies. And it's really easy to test out the functionality, right? All of the external dependencies, all of the IO calls of this controller are now set up in such a way that it's very easy to pass in different implementations, which means you can pass in different mocks, which means you can test a lot easier than before. So I've kind of debated in my head back and forth, like, is this actually a better approach? Is ha having the dependencies passed in a better approach? Um, and honestly, if you start a project with SQL, there's a very low chance that you're going to switch from SQL. Like this project's probably going to live and die on SQL, but it does allow for testing to be a lot easier in my opinion. So I think it is worth the benefit. So, but you can just do what you want. You don't have to follow these rules. Like all of these are just kind of like, none of these are really hard rules. Like you could just follow them if you want to. If you think that they would help you write better code, then I would recommend that you follow them. Having public getters and setters for all of the entities can be a lot of overhead. Um, I used to work in Java and like everything's just a method just to do something simple. But there is an underlying benefit and the choice is up to you to decide is this an over engineering solution? Like am I over engineering something or is this actually beneficial to my team and my project? All right, well, I hope you enjoyed watching this. Again, I just wanted to kind of touch on this subject a little bit and hopefully enlighten you on how to write maybe cleaner code, maybe follow clean architecture a little bit. But if you enjoyed watching this, give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment below if you watched this full video and you understood something. And like always, be sure to subscribe if you're new to this channel because I'm going to have other videos like this in the future that should help you become a better web developer.